Hey guys, what is up? Super K Man Rocks here, and I am here for my LCK Regional Qualifier Finals Overview and Analysis. That means we're only talking about one series here, but it's a very important series as the winner here is going to be the team that moves on to Worlds as the final representative from the LCK, the number four seed. So a super important game, obviously, for both of the teams involved, but... Before we jump into any of that, let me know down in the comment section below what you guys thought of this series. Did you like it? Did you think it was fun? Did you not like it? Did you think it was boring? Who did you expect to win and did it happen? Let me know all of that down in the comment section below. You know I love chatting it up with you guys, but I don't want to waste too much time on this intro because we have a very, very, very interesting series to go over here in our regional qualifier final. So... How did we get here? Well, the three and the four seed faced off. We had Damwon taking on Liv Sandbox, and Damwon was able to take that series actually pretty cleanly in four games. And then on the lower bracket of the series, you had the 5-6 matchup between DRX and KT Rolster, which was a phenomenal comeback from DRX in order to secure their spot here in the regional qualifying finals. Obviously, huge game for both of these teams, but let's go ahead and get to previewing it. So... Our matchup is, of course, going to be the number three-seeded Liv Sandbox versus the number six-seeded DRX. A rematch of the first round of the actual LCK playoffs here, but this time the stakes are just a tad bit higher. There is no more opportunity to lose. You can no longer lose and make worlds. The, uh, the winner makes worlds, the loser does not. It is as simple as that. And these two teams match up very interestingly. We saw in the first round when they played each other that Prince was absolutely ginormous for Sandbox, as he has been the entirety of the year. Prince has really been the guy for the Sandbox team to be able to carry them across the finish line. Him and Kale have generated a phenomenal synergy there in the bot lane. And then Krakow has really done a good job of being able to... Kind of make sure that those two are always in a good spot by the mid to late game so that he can carry. Uh, DRX, though, definitely not the same team that this Live Sandbox team saw in the first round because they've really made some changes in the jungle. Obviously, Pioshik, the player that had been playing pretty much the entire season for DRX, he was their best player last year by a considerable margin, and they roll back with him this year, but... His stop-start, his hot and cold tendencies really took over for a majority of this year, and so they decided in the regional qualifier to take a punt on Juhan, who was their, you know, quote-unquote backup, their substitute jungler. Obviously, a lot of people may know Juhan from his time on PSG Talon. He went to MSI with that team this year, so you might be relatively familiar with him in that regard, but really not a lot of experience playing in the LCK, which is a completely different beast than the PCS, and so... It looks like Juhan is going to be taking the reins at the beginning of the series, and that could be a good thing, could be a bad thing. Obviously, his ceiling, I think, is a little bit lower than what I would expect from Pioshik, but he certainly has shown a higher floor and definitely more of an early game mindset, which I think definitely helps out this DRX team a ton. So, let's go ahead and see who is going to be able to generate the lead here in game number one. Well, game number one was... A DRX win. A huge win for DRX to start off the series with the W. You really needed to generate that momentum early to show that you could be just as good as the Sandbox team because you did kind of get a little bit outclassed the last time you played them and pretty much every time you've played them so far over the course of the season. But it really was your star player stepping up. It was Zika on this Akali that really came out and showed up and showed out. Uh, the Akali pick can really work. It can sometimes not work. We definitely see that. Uh, throughout the course of the season that Akali can take over a game here and can really make like squishy teams lives hell like even the mini nar Vic uh, Victor definitely Neela definitely like these are picks that Akali really has a good shot of being able to blow up and I like the Akali in matchups like this but we've definitely seen situations where even with gold Akali towards the back half of the game just doesn't have a good target to blow up if she's going into something like the Silas Maybe she has, like, a top lane Orn, like, things that are much, much more difficult to actively deal with. Akali might not be as useful, but luckily, in this game, DRX knew what they were getting into. They go for the Akali, and it absolutely works. Zika's going to get my player of the game here in game number one. He really has been the guy for DRX. I talked about this in the series last week, or, you know, a couple days ago against KT Rolster. I think 
Deft gets a lot of credit on this team for being consistent, but Zika does not get nearly enough credit for being the best player on this team, because he just is. I know a lot of people really do like Deft, but Zika has been the guy. When DRX wins, it is because of Zika, and when DRX loses, it's because Zika can't carry. Like, that is really as simple as that. He is the heart and soul of this DRX team, and it's really good to see him kind of showing up. I think a lot of people really slept on him. He was really good on BLG last year, and a lot of people I just don't think watched him on BLG last year, and so when he came over to DRX, I think some people were just kind of expecting it to be a little bit different, but he's really showed up and showed out here on DRX, and he's really proven that he's one of the best mid laners in the LCK, in my opinion. But Deft also had a good game, and a ton, a ton, a ton of credit to Juhan here on the Poppy. Uh, obviously, he comes in here and plays more for the early game. He gets the Poppy matchup into Sejuani, which I think is very good for the Poppy. I think it's one of Poppy's better matchups in terms of the meta right now. And Juhan takes advantage of it. He goes mid and he's able to lock down the victor. He's able to make sure kills are happening there. He goes bot lane and he makes sure that the Nila has a really, really tough time of actively being able to play the game. That is a champion where if you fall behind, even with something like a Yumi, and even if you do have the front line of Meganar and Sejuani, like you're going to have a hard time actively doing a ton of damage from behind because this champion just doesn't scale all that well unless you're from ahead. Like you're the whole point of the champion is that you gain extra XP, but that essentially just makes you neutral from behind, and Zeri is significantly better than this champion from neutral, so, you know, I'm not a huge fan of the Nila pick, I've talked about that over the course of the season, I think it's a little bit overrated, but it is what it is, um, definitely something that the Poppy is going to be able to take advantage of, because this team has so many dashes, and then Victor, so, uh, yeah, Juhan played it really well, the early game aggression was great in the mid and bot lane, and he was able to secure a lot of the objectives, yes, he was able to trade some of them for towers as well, uh, but at the end of the day, like, he did the right play. I, I honestly think that, for the most part, Juhan was an upgrade here to the macro of DRX's game. But, honestly, everybody on DRX kind of held up their own end of the bargain. It was Juhan and Zika that I thought were the main carries, but Deft had a really good game here on the Zeri, especially towards the back half. Barrel was significantly more consistent on the Lulu in this game than he has been over the course of the season, where, honestly, he hasn't been all that good. And Kingen just kind of has been what he has been all year, going to something like the Aatrox, not really being all that impactful in laning phase, but... Being able to make an impact in some of these team fights, obviously Aatrox is one of those picks that can completely split a team fight. Obviously, not the biggest front to back comp that Live Sandbox is doing here, but still the Aatrox pick was useful and was able to compound with all the other picks in the end to make it worthwhile. As for Sandbox, tough game one. You definitely wanted to come out with maybe a little bit of a better look than this. I really, really do not like this draft. Victor Nila as your two carry rolls are just not. What I want to see overall, I think both of them are very weak in comparison to what the main meta champions are in those positions right now. Victor especially, I think is a complete, like, I, I don't even get it at all. We've been talking about it all year. Closer is an assassin player. That's what he does. He plays the Ari. He plays the Akali. He plays the LeBlanc. That's what he does. That's what he works well on. He has always been, always been significantly worse on picks like Victor, picks like Oriana. They've not really been his style, but you go to it in game number one here. Victor's not even all that strong right now, and Zika really is able to take advantage of this matchup, both in lane and out of lane, to just create so much havoc across the map. Closer's not my dud of the game. That's going to go to Dove in the top lane, who just did not have a good game of Gnar. Got completely abused in the mid game here, trying to make plays around Rift Herald. And then eventually got to the point in the game where he wasn't even able to get Meganar in fights because he was just dying way too fast. The Akali was really consistently able to blow up Dove, so Dove's going to get my dud of the game in game number one. But Krako didn't play well, Prince didn't play well, it really wasn't his fault. Again, Nila from behind is just not all that good, you can't go in and kill people, so you just kind of go in and die instead. And then Kale on the Yumi didn't really have much of an impact. Overall, definitely a disappointing showing from Sandbox in the first game. You would really hope that the team with the... Uh, you know, the better regular season record, a team that's really consistently been able to beat DRX over the course of the season would come out and take a dub in the first game, but series is far from over, obviously. Um, we've seen so many five-game sets, we've seen even so many reverse sweeps. I'm not going to count anybody out after one game. Uh, everybody has been so resilient in these playoffs, and nobody's really been able to close the book on good teams, so certainly not counting anything out after game one, but Live Sandbox, I, I just want to see them go to maybe a little bit more of a proactive draft, maybe something more of like an assassin in the mid lane, even if you don't want to go an assassin, you ban the Swain and the Talia, those picks I think are going to be a lot more safe 
than something like the Victor here, who's just not really going to gonna accomplish anything. And then you have the Nila in the bot lane. I just wouldn't go to that champion. Even if I do think she can carry the game in certain scenarios, I do think it's way more specific than what you would want out of your AD carry right now. And definitely not something that's going to be consistent into a Zeri lane. So overall, I would say I just want to see Liv change her draft just a tad bit and play for the early game more. DRX just needs to keep this. This was a great game one. If you can match this again in game number two, you're going to be in a really good spot. So... Are they able to do that? Are they able to match it in game number two? Well, the winner of game number two was... Live Sandbox! A huge win for them in game number two, and it really was earned. They dominated this game, even more so than I think the scoreline might tell you, because obviously these scorelines look relatively close, especially the gold difference, but... Man, this was uh, not all that close of a game in the beginning here. Liv Sandbox got out to a ginormous lead at the beginning of this game and just almost couldn't close it out. Really, I think it was pretty incredible from DRX to be able to stay in this game as long as they did with the early lead that Liv Sandbox was able to generate here. A really early game comp from Liv as you go for the Trundle, Callista, Leona. This is a super aggressive like trio here to be going into the bottom lane. And you really have to win early. I actually really like DRX's answer here of Ezreal because Callista really wants to snowball the game out of control. She wants to get some of those kills early. She wants to pressure you off of the wave. But Ezreal can just play safe, farm it up, and get to the late game. Even if I don't think Ezreal is all that good right now, we know it's deft. And it's deft on Ezreal. He's going to be fine. It's one of his best picks of all time. He may be the best Ezreal ever. Him and Prey certainly can debate over that for forever, but... Um, I like the idea here. Uh, unfortunately for them, uh, Beryl and Juhan weren't quite on the same page in terms of playing safe and playing to the point where they couldn't get snowballed out of control on. So Krako ends up coming bot a lot. The, the game plan that Sandbox really uses over and over again to make sure that Prince is in a spot where he can carry the game. He gets a ton of gold here on the Callista from killing the Vi, from killing the uh, Renata, even from killing the Ezreal at points. And is able to really just become ridiculously strong in this game. Uh, Kale does a good job of setting up a lot of that. Krako does a great job in the mid game. But you start getting to these plays where it's like, well, they have all the towers and they have all the dragons and they have all the kills. Like we're basically getting perfect gamed at like 20 minutes. But then they start taking team fights and DRX is fighting back. They start getting picks here. Deft plays really, really well towards the back half of this game and he really starts to make it interesting for DRX. I'm not going to say he made it super close, but there were definitely points in the game where it was like, is DRX really going to climb their way back into this game just solely based off of team fighting and no macro decisions at all? They're not able to get any objectives. They're really not able to get any towers unless they trade a bunch in return. So really a lot of just, just great fighting at the end for DRX. But in the end, Liv Sandbox is able to close out the game. Prince is able to do enough damage on this Callista pick, which is able to do a considerable amount late game. I think a lot of people talk about Callista as just an early game champion, but she does scale pretty decently into the late game if you do play her well. And for that, I think Prince is going to get my player of the game in game number two. He's gotten a billion of these for Sandbox over the course of the year. He's been this team's MVP. He was number two in MVP voting for the LCK, both in real life and in my opinion. Um, he's just been really, really solid. Obviously, it wasn't just him in this game. Krako did a great job of investing into him in the early game to make sure that he got to the point where he was able to take over the game as the Callista, but Prince still has to execute on that, and I think he did it well. Shout out to Closer, shout out to Kale, shout out to Dove. They all did their roles fine here. It wasn't the cleanest game of all time, but at the end of the day, they generated a huge lead in the early game because of the big jungle mismatch that they had in this game, and they were able to eventually close the game out, even if there was a little bit of a hiccup in the middle of the game there. For DRX, uh, both good and bad in this game. Obviously, bad that you got off to such an awful start that you got into a position with Juhan and with Barrel where they were just kind of running it down for a lot of the early part of this game, setting themselves up to be in a much more difficult spot. Even Zika really wasn't playing all that well in the mid lane on the Azir in game number two here, and I always talk about this when Zika's not playing well. DRX has a much, much more difficult time winning because of how much they rely on his damage in the back half of these games to win. Um, but they do end up getting to a spot where they are able to fight at least a little bit. Deft is doing a million damage on this Ezreal pick that really isn't even all that strong. This was a great game from Deft. I know I've been a little bit lower on Deft than I think community sentiment, but this was a really phenomenal game number two from him. And I think if he had a little bit more assistance, this could have been a little bit easier and potentially even possible for DRX to come back and win this game. But unfortunately, it was just Deft versus the world. Zika wasn't strong. Beryl and Juhan were running it down. I'll get to Juhan. And Kingen had an awful end of this game. 
game. He was actually doing pretty okay towards the beginning half here on the Gwen into the Orna matchup that you should relatively be able to win as the Gwen, but he made some really big mistakes towards the back half of these team fights, getting blown up way too early. I think if he survives just a tad bit longer in some of these fights, that DRX has a little bit of a better shot. And then, like I said, if you had a little bit more damage on the Azir, perhaps this is a little bit better anyways. But my dud of the game is a pretty easy choice in this one. It is going to go to Juhan in the jungle. I know we've been talking about how he's been a huge upgrade to DRX since coming in, but this was not a very good game number two. Got completely outjungled. Like, completely ran circles around by Croco in this game, and it was definitely a little bit disappointing. And then towards the late game, he really wasn't all that important Anyways, like, you have the Vi to be able to kind of go in here, but who are you going in on? Like, Ari can just dash away from you once you ult. Uh, Kalista is not really that great of a target because she's gonna have so much peel with the Leona and the Orn on top of her. I really just don't know what the idea is here for the Vi. It doesn't really work out, and Juhan is gonna get my dud of the game for that. But overall, I'd say DRX definitely had moments in this game where they looked better. Like, at least okay, like, serviceable, especially Deft, who really tried to pull it back in the end, but... Uh, it really wasn't going to be enough after what was a disastrous early game for this team. For Live Sandbox, this is what I want to see. I want to see some early game aggression. I want to see them investing into Prince, into the bottom lane, because you know that if you invest in him, he's going to pay it back, at least most of the time. And that should be a formula to be able to win this series relatively cleanly. So I'd like to see them just kind of go back to this strategy. For DRX, just go back to what you did in game number one. Whoever wins the early game here, I think is going to be set up in a much, much better spot to trail into the end game. So... Who is that going to be in game number three? Well, the winner of game number three was Live Sandbox. They are able to take game number three and put themselves up two to one in this pivotal, pivotal final series of the year in the LCK. Uh, a great win for Live, and honestly, in a way that I really did not expect. You do go for that early game comp that I was talking about, that early game advantage that I think whoever got was going to be in a good spot. You go for that. You go for the Wukong in the jungle. You go for the Lucian Nami in the bottom lane, really just hoping to be able to snowball that lane out of control to the point where they can win in the mid game. You have Closer on the Azir. You have a Fiora potentially to split push, and the game basically went exactly as planned here if that was your goal. This was basically... Perfect for Live Sandbox. I would say this game is significantly cleaner than it was in game number two. A big win for them. My player of the game is actually going to go to Dove in the top lane. I've been very critical of Dove throughout the season, and for good reason, I think, for the most part. He really has been the weak link of the Sandbox team over the course of the year, but this was a really, really important and good game in game number three here. He pulls out the Fiora, tries to go for that more aggressive counterpick to something like the Camille, and... In the top lane, that very much can work. You can repost, obviously, the hook shot to avoid getting stunned. And then you're in a really, really bad spot if you are Kingen. You don't really have a lot of ways to continuously pressure the Fiora at that point. And even if you are relatively decent in a side lane, like you're not some top laner that just wants to team fight all the time, like the Aatrox, you're still not able to fully compete with the Fiora in the top lane, especially if she's ahead. So my player of the game is going to go to Dub for the amount of pressure that he really was able to create in game number three here, but... Tons and tons and tons of credit to Croco, Prince, and Kale because they really executed that Game 2 strategy again here in Game 3, but they were able to translate it at least a little bit more cleanly towards the back half here. Krakow did a great job in the early game on a winning matchup, the Wukong into the Vi again. Wukong, I just think, is so strong in the early game. There's so many things that he does across the map. His ganks are impeccable. He clears incredibly quickly. He's just ridiculously strong right now, and he played it really, really well. Gotta give a ton of credit to Krakow because he goes bot lane, and he ensures that Prince and Kale have a giant lead in this bottom lane on Deft and Barrel. They do a great job to compound that lead, and honestly, pretty much every single lane for Live Sandbox 1, with maybe the exception of the mid lane, but even in the mid lane, you eventually got to this point on the Azir where you were able to do a ton of damage towards the back half of this game and make even potential 4v5s really unwinnable for DRX. So overall, I'd say this was a phenomenal game from Live Sandbox, mostly off the back of Dove really creating so much pressure in the top lane, but big shout out to Croco, big shout out to Prince and Kale for being able to dominate that early game and translate it at least a little bit more cleanly into objectives in the mid game, and then shout out to Closer for not really giving up too much in the mid lane, even when he was losing straight up in the 1v1. For DRX, I gotta point out another substitution. Pioshik was back in here in game number three. Juhan had a very bad game number two, so they decided to go with Pioshik for game number three, and that did not work out. Not just because they lost, but Pioshik was not all that good in this game, and it really shows why Juhan was in in the first place here in the jungle, but... Neither of them are going to get my dud of the game. My dud of the game is going to go to Barrel on the Lulu here. Barrel has been someone who I've been very critical of over the course of this split. This was someone who I was considering the number one support in the world last year 
And it is, oh, how the mighty have fallen. He is nowhere near that conversation anymore after his year on DRX. He has been very, very bad in terms of getting caught and just being out of position and not really being all that much of an asset to this DRX team. And he did it again here in this game number three where he picks the Lulu. And all Lulu has to do is sit behind the Zeri and make sure that she's in a position to not die. And Barrel tries to play way too aggressive, tries to go for way too much poke. Croco, Prince, and Kale are able to take advantage of that. And a lot of the early game lead that Liv Sandbox is able to generate in that bottom lane is mostly because of Barrel's uh, mispositioning and just over-aggression on that Lulu. It's not really a lane that you need to play to win here, and I don't really understand why Barrel felt the necessity to do that in this game, but definitely some blame has to go on Deft as well for losing this lane. It's not really just Barrel's fault, but Deft definitely didn't have a ton of say in how the sway of this lane went. Overall, on this area, you still need to be able to scale up into that late game and do a lot of damage. This isn't the Ezreal pick where you can just play ridiculously safe. You are going to have to risk yourself at least a little bit for the chance to stay relatively even to something like Lucian Nami, especially if Wukong just kind of comes out of nowhere and ults you. So um, definitely not the best laning phase for Deft, but, you know, it, it is what it is. DRX is bot lane lost, and sometimes they do that. It really, they're not like unbeatable or anything like that. Like I said, Pioshik and Kingen really weren't all that good either. Kingen has to go into this Fiora where he just gets completely clowned on in the early game and has really no chance to be able to match that towards the mid to late game. And then Pioshik was just bad on the Vi. This is a pick that I, I I've been telling teams not to go to. Vi, I get it. Point and click ult is really good. But she does actually nothing else outside of that. You're giving up a ton of early pressure because something like a Wukong or a Poppy or a Trundle just does so well in creating that early pressure on their own that Vi really can't match up to that. So... I'm basically out on this Vi pick pretty much entirely now. I think in certain scenarios, it can be really good if you feel like you have early pressure elsewhere on the map that you don't need your jungler to generate that by itself. But even then, like, I, I just don't think it's very, like, efficient. It's not going to be consistent. I really don't think Vi is a pick that I would necessarily keep going to, and I just see every team prioritizing it super highly. I'm just, I'm much lower on the Vi pick, I think, overall. And Pioshik, both Juhan and Pioshik in games 2 and 3, I think really showed that off for DRX. Her win rate in pro is not good. It is not good at all. And teams still keep going back to her. I would say poor Zika. He did his best in this game. He really did win laning phase early on this Silas. He did a really good job into this year of making sure that he was up in lane and being able to move to those objective fights. But nobody else on this team was really able to do all that much. So he was just kind of left out to dry. By the end of the game, he really wasn't all that relevant because nobody could follow up on anything that the Silas was doing. They didn't have any damage from the Zeri. They didn't have any protection from the Lulu, and Camille was in the top lane just trying to beg Fiora to not push on him. So, overall, not a great game here from DRX, but it is salvageable. Like I say, going down 2-1 to one in a series is usually pretty bad in the playoffs, but these playoffs have definitely been different. We've seen so many reverse sweeps. We've seen so many series go to five games across pretty much every single major region. Maybe even with the exception of the LEC, that's really the only region that hasn't consistently been at five games. But even in the LCK here, there have been so many close series that there really is a chance that DRX can just figure it out. I don't think P.O. Shik is going to last in the series. I would expect to see Juhan back in. This team has looked a ton better with him than they have with P.O. Shik. And hopefully, again, if you can generate that early lead, like I said, whichever team does that is probably going to be in a spot to be able to carry that into the late game and just win out from there. So if DRX can do that over the next two games, they can probably move on. All Live Sandbox has to do, though, is do that for one, and they're going to be the final team moving on to the 2022 World Championship. So... Are, is Live Sandbox going to be able to close out the series here in game number four, or is DRX going to keep their world's dreams alive? Well, the winner of game number four was DRX. They are able to take game number four and push us to another game five here in the LCK Regional Finals. You got to be really excited about that, but let's talk about how we got there in game number four here. Big win for DRX, and again... It's off of their main playmaker. It's off of Zika, who just continues to be the guy on DRX that carries them when they win these games. I know, I know people are going to be like, Deft went 5 0 1, and Barrel played a decent game here. And yeah, I agree. I'll, I'll get to them in a minute. But Zika is the guy that all of the momentum in this game runs through. Whether Juhan, who's back in, by the way, getting on the Sejuani here, wants to invest into that mid lane, which he did a lot early. He invested a ton there early on to make sure that Azir was in a good spot to be able to carry the back half of this game. But then it was the Azir making sure that he was rotating early to these objective fights, which is something that honestly I criticize Azir for in pro play because it's really not his strength. His strength is not being able to make sure that he's at these objective fights first. His strength is typically being able to generate that lead in lane by himself, and then just hopefully in the late game be able to take over and do a ton of damage with these auto attacks. 
But I thought Zika did a really, really great job to be able to take that idea and really expand on it to make it a global pressure idea for DRX. A great game from Amir in the mid lane. Got to give him player of the game in game number four. And then you got to give credit to the bot lane. They won in, a, in the same matchup that they played basically in the last game. Live Sandbox basically goes to the exact same draft. A few differences, but basically the exact same draft here in game number four that they did in game number three. And it just doesn't work quite as well this time because DRX, you know, ha had a game plan. They went into it with an idea of how they wanted to counter it out. Now, I don't love the idea, but it certainly worked. Obviously, you bring back the Lucian Nami. I do have to be a little bit critical of the Nami build because, it, again, Void Staff on Nami just isn't it. Like, I, come on. Like, I, I don't know. I, I get it. Like, her AP ratios are bad, but, like, the pen really doesn't make her that much more damage and it doesn't increase any of her healing and shielding, so... I don't know. Uh, anyways, Deft and Barrel do a good job of being able to survive the early laning phase this time with not nearly the strength of the Krako Wukong coming out, and uh, they're able to get to that late game Zeri point where Zeri's just going to be able to take over a lot of these team fights towards the back half. You have the Azir there as well. You have the Sejuani and the Aatrox on the flank. Your 5v5 team fight is absolutely ridiculous and still very, very strong in this game, although you are taking a pretty huge risk by drafting this comp again because when you look at Liv Sandbox's comp, they draft the Fiora. Again, this is basically the same comp they ran in game three, and Fiora absolutely picked their macro apart by being somebody who you could just stick in a side lane and really not have anybody that can answer it super cleanly. It basically had to be the Camille, and that made the 4v4 a lot more difficult for DRX. But in this game, they honestly just say, screw it, we're going to leave the Fiora alone. We're going to go for the Aatrox, and we're going to go for these 5v4 team fights. We're going to try to take the main advantage, and we're going to try to out-macro you in that sense, where the Fiora is going to feel pressured to have to back to stop the pressure that we're able to put onto you. And it's a strategy that doesn't often work in pro. Usually teams that get picked apart in terms of, like, side lane pressure are just not in good spots. But even with the Fiora being relatively strong here, I think Dove also being the best player on Sandbox again here in game number four. It just didn't quite matter that the team fights were going so in favor of DRX. Zika and Deft and Barrel were so big. And even Juhan was really, like, so big towards the back half of this game that they really weren't going to be able to lose even in the 4v4. And then that's not even adding in the fact that Aatrox can split this entire comp in half. They can basically force the Lucian entirely out of this fight because of his low range. Aatrox is really able to pressure him in a really, really strong way towards the back half of this game. So overall, really good draft from DRX, and they played it basically perfectly. I'm not sure exactly if this is what I would have gone for. I certainly would have got would have not gone for the Aatrox, and the azir Zeri combination that didn't work in game number three is certainly a questionable one to go back to in game number four, but who am I to question success uh, at the end of the day? So for Sandbox, this just was a significantly worse early game. That really was it. You have an early game comp here. You redraft the Wukong Lucian Nami, which is an incredibly strong trio, maybe the strongest in the game, in the early game right now, and you just aren't able to execute on it in nearly the same way that you were able to in game number three. Uh, Juhan does a really good job, or a much better job of Pioshik, uh than tracking Wu uh, at tracking Wukong here in this game, making sure that he gets Zika, his main carry, ahead on this Azir, and then he can go to bot lane and start helping out the Zarian Lulu. Uh, he can really ignore the Aatrox in the top lane because for the early part of that game, Aatrox should actually be able to win that matchup pretty easily. And so for the most part, I would say that a lot of this falls on the fact that Krakow just wasn't able to generate that same kind of lead that Wukong had in the early game in game number three. So he's going to get my dud of the game in game number four here. Not the worst game overall from him, but definitely wanted to see a little bit more proactivity once he got behind in the early game. Once things started to not go his way, he really had no way to rebound. Wukong's one of the better champions in the game at rebounding and being useful in the late game, even when you're not ridiculously fed, just because he's just Wukong, like, everything he does is so useful, uh, but Krako did a poor job of, like, actively taking over on that, in my opinion, and then you gotta give a lot of, uh, a lot of blowback to Prince and Kale here, who just didn't have nearly the same kind of early game that they did in game number three, obviously, not nearly the same kind of support, but you should be able to win this 2v2 lane, it's not like Juhan was going bot all the time in the early game here for, uh, DRX, and so you should have been able to just win this 2v2, but Kale played a lot worse, I think, in game number two here, Prince was certainly not all that useful on the Lucian, especially moving into the mid game where Lucian really power spikes. He really just wasn't able to do a lot. He was getting completely zoned out here by the Sejuani, by the Aatrox in a lot of these late game team fights and really just didn't have an impact on the game at all. And when Prince isn't really having an impact for Sandbox, they really have no chance of winning the game. He is the guy for this team. And if he can't play, then they're not going to win. Even when Dubbed has, again, one of his better games in quite a long time. Fiora is clearly a pick that he's very comfortable on and that Sandbox definitely has a good shot of being able to win on, but the rest of the team does have to hold up their end of the bargain. So poor Deft, not Deft, poor Dove, uh, unfortunately gets put in this position where he just isn't able to carry the game for Sandbox on this Fiora. Everybody else is just losing a bit too much, but 
Overall, still a decent game, I would say, from Sandbox. I like the draft. You just weren't able to execute on it. I don't like DRX, uh, DRX's draft. They just were able to execute on it. I think if you ran this match, you know, 10 times, they, you know, Sandbox would probably win six or seven of those. But you've only got one more shot. So do you feel comfortable enough to go with this draft again after you just lost on it back into game number five? Or are you going to switch things up for DRX? Do you feel comfortable enough on this game four draft, even if it isn't on paper the best draft in the world? Do you feel comfortable enough to go back to it for a pivotal game number five? Obviously, it is win or go home. This is the final game in the LCK in the 2022 Summer Split. Who is going to take it and take the final seed at Worlds, the four seed at Worlds? Is it going to be Sandbox? Is it going to be DRX? Well, the winner of game number five was... DRX. They are able to do it. They are able to take game number five and go to Worlds as the number four seed out of the LCK. The lowest seed in the regional gauntlet here. The sixth seed beating KT, beating Liv Sandbox. Two very big series for this team that has really, really turned around its momentum from the back half of the season. A huge win for them and a huge win for this organization. Let's go ahead and talk about how they got here. Well, a lot of these games were really close. Games 1, 2, 3, 4, all were relatively close, especially games 2 and 3, and well, 2, 3, and 4, I should say, were all really, really close games, at least in the, in the grand scheme of things. But this was the biggest blowout of the series by a considerable margin. DRX really showed up in this game number 5 and took it home. Juhan was still in, and man, did he have an early game here. Krako goes on the trap pick Vi in the jungle here. Juhan goes on the Sejuani, which... Theoretically, shouldn't have nearly as much pressure, but Sedge is just so much more useful as a pick in the meta right now that he's able to create so much on the map, whether it's in the mid lane, whether it's in the bot lane. There's so much that he's able to do. He gets super duper fed on the Sejuani, and he is very, very nearly my player of the game in game number five. But player of the game here, pretty easy choice for me, has to go to Barrel on this Soraka pick. Freaking love it. He pulls out the Soraka. We saw this in the LEC just a couple of days ago. And now we're seeing it in the uh, LCK Regional Gauntlet Qualifiers. Like, I, I love this pick. I've been talking about it on the channel for so long. Janna, Soraka, these are the things I really want to see as quote-unquote counters to things like Lulu, like Yumi. I think they can be just as useful, especially when those things are banned out. You can have a lot of opportunity to really pick enchanters that are strong. Maybe they aren't the strongest in the meta, but they are good. And Barrel really shows the power of Soraka in this game, as there was absolutely no chance you were killing anybody on this team after 20 minutes. These team fights were so easy. Yes, they were up a ton of gold, but even in lane, he gave Deft so much prio into this matchup against Sivir that it was basically over by five minutes into the game because Deft was just so strong. Yes, Juhan was also coming bot and making sure that Prince's life was really, really difficult in this game, but you got to give a ton of credit to Barrel for playing that Soraka for really just being unkillable and making his entire team unkillable in this game. A great game from him. Really happy to see him pull it out in game five of a winner go home series. And uh, he's going to get my player of the game for it. Even if he wasn't perfect all series long, this was a very fun game five from Barrel. A lot of credit to Deft in that same way. He was given a lot of the tools from Barrel and Juhan this game, but he still had to take advantage of them, and he absolutely did take advantage of them. He was very, very good in this game. He really just outplayed Prince. There's really no other way to put it. He was just simply better in this game. Obviously, a ton more resources given his way, but he was phenomenal on the Zeri. You go for the Sivir Zeri handshake. Both teams really feeling okay taking that, and the Zeri just played better and uh, was able to take this game. And then a lot of credit to Zika in the mid lane, who again was phenomenal on the Silas. He was given a little bit of attention early, but honestly, most of the lead generate here on the Ari was basically just the 1v1 matchup. Closer, Ari being one of his better champions, probably his best champion so far in the playoffs, Zika said, screw it, I'll give it to you in game number five. I'm going to play the Silas, and I'm just going to beat you. And Zika did that. It's been amazing to watch people really slowly start to realize how good Zika is as a mid laner. A lot of people weren't expecting him to be the guy on this DRX team, but he has absolutely turned into the main carry and the guy on this DRX team. And it's very fun to see. I'm, a, I'm really excited to see him at Worlds. Kingen has watched Dove now take the side laners for the last two games of the Fiora. He said, screw it, I'm going to play the Jax. I want, a, I want a little bit of this action. And he's able to pull that Aatrox out. This is the reason that the Aatrox matchup is not all that good into side laners because yes, you can get a man advantage here, but Jax can really take over that side lane. And if you're not dominatingly winning those 5v4 team fights, it's never going to be worth it. And so Kingen really makes uh, Dove pay a lot on this Aatrox overall. And it's just really, really solid. So DRX basically played this game perfectly. This was a complete domination from them. And I'm really, really excited to see it. As for Sandbox, 
a really tough way to end your season. You're a team that came into the regional gauntlet as the three seed and weren't able to make worlds. You definitely don't love to see that. Prince is going to get my dud of the game in game number five here. He had to be the one to step up. The entire season was really on his shoulders, and unfortunately, he wasn't able to do it on the Sivir in this game. This comp really relies on him being able to generate that lead and be able to contribute in the late game, but he got so far behind in the early game. I'm not saying it's entirely his fault. Again, a ton of investment into his lane from Juhan, but Krakow was really never going to be able to answer that on the Vi. We've talked about how Vi is not really all that good in the early to mid game, and then Prince just got so far behind to the point that the game was completely over for Sandbox by like 10 minutes into the game. So definitely not what you wanted to see in game number five out of these two, out of, out of Sandbox at least. Their season is now officially over. What do I think of how they played their season? Well, they're going to be very disappointed that they're not at the World Championships after being the number three team in the LCK in summer. But at the end of the day, you have to play your way in and they couldn't quite do it. I never quite saw this team as a top four team. I, I know a lot of people were really mad at me throughout the course of all my power rankings because I had DRX higher than them throughout most of the season. Um, obviously, they figured things out in the end, and I think they they were more talented than, than Sandbox, which is why I just felt confident about them being better. But at the end of the day, the Sandbox team definitely should have been a team that made Worlds. They overperformed pretty much all expectations. I think a lot of people had them as a bottom three team going into the year. For them to even have been in the spot in the first place, I think is very good. You found some diamonds in the rough. Obviously, we knew Krakow was a good player. But Prince and Kale have been unbelievable for Sandbox this year, and I would be absolutely stunned if we don't see those three back as a trio next year, either on the Sandbox team or somewhere else. They have so much good synergy together. They can be the best team in the LCK if you get the right pieces around them, but... I really think it was the solo laners that let Sandbox down. I was talking about it all year. Dove and Closer really just weren't it. Closer got better as the series or as the season went on, or really just kind of moving away from a lot of those control mages and going back on the assassins, like the things that he plays really well. But at the end of the day, his champion pool is so limited that I'm really concerned about his ability to be a top quality LCK mid. And that's what the Sandbox team really needs right now is somebody who can push this team to be one of the best in the region. And then Dove, I think we can all agree, is just not good enough to be on this team. He had some good games here in this series, but over the course of the season, he really was the big weak link of Sandbox. So I would expect, ideally, if I'm Sandbox, bring back your jungle, bring back your bot lane, and then maybe look for two new solo laners to really put this team over the top. It might be time to spend in the offseason, but whatever you do, you've got a very good core as long as you keep it together. For DRX, they're moving on to Worlds! Woo! Uh, you gotta be excited for them. They have to go through play-ins, which isn't the most, you know, calming thing of all time, but with Juhan, this team looks better than ever, and I really think that they could be going into play-ins with a ton of momentum. Zika is going to be one of the best players there. So is Deft, so is Juhan, hell, so is Beryl, even if Beryl isn't always perfect. Uh, even King made huge, huge strides over the course of this year. It's no secret that I am a pretty big fan of this DRX team and this DRX organization, and I'm really, really happy to see them make the World Championships here. Obviously, not trying to be biased. I, I really try to stay away from bias on this channel, but I'm very, very happy to see an organization with these players be able to make it. Uh, Zika is a pretty clear choice for player of the series for me in the regional finals here. He was phenomenal pretty much in every single game, with the exception of maybe game two, where he wasn't all that good. But game three, uh, Zika was the only one who doesn't get smashed in lane. Game four, one, and five, he was a big part of them being able to win those. And so it was a pretty easy choice for me to pick Zika as my player of the series. But overall, DRX just played great. And I'm really, really excited to see what this team is going to be able to do on the international stage. All right, that is going to do it for my LCK Regional Finals overview and analysis. And you know what? That means we are done with the LCK. The LCK is officially wrapped up. We know all four teams that are going to Worlds, their seeds, everything. The LCK is done. The only thing left for them is the four teams at the World Championships. Of course, up on the screen right now, you're going to be seeing who those four teams are. Genji obviously winning the finals goes as the one seed. T1 losing the finals goes as the two seed. Damwon picking up that third seed game. And then DRX, as we just saw, being able to win their spot as the fourth seed. I think a lot of people, if you showed this to them at the beginning of the year, would be like, yeah, it's obvious. These are the four best teams in the league. Like, of course, they're the four going to Worlds. But there were certainly some shaky points for, for most of these teams throughout the season. Genji and T1 always did feel like a step above pretty much everybody else throughout the season. Genji really proving that in the finals with a dominant sweep, but Damwon and DRX certainly had their ups and downs throughout the split. They both were able to get their heads on straight at the right time. Damwon was able to take out Sandbox pretty easily, and DRX does finish the job here, and they are able to claim that fourth spot. So really, really happy. It does feel like we are getting the four best teams 
from the LCK going to Worlds. No offense, Live Sandbox fans. I know you, there's a ton of you in the comment section below, but I really do believe that we are getting the four best teams from the LCK going to Worlds, and I'm really, really excited to see what they're going to be able to do on that stage, but... Hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, please go ahead and leave a like. I've put out a ton of content this year. I think I just went back and looked at the amount of summer content that I was able to put out. At least up to this point, I put out like over 58 hours or something of content over the course of the last few months. And, I, you know, you guys have been a huge part of that. You guys have been liking, you guys have been talking in the comment section. I'm really appreciative of it. If you did like this video, please go ahead and leave a like. It really does help me out a ton. Obviously, hit the subscribe button if you want to see more. We're wrapping up a lot of the other regions uh, very, very soon as well. Obviously, their playoffs are coming to an end. And then we're going to be getting into the Spicy Worlds content that I know you all are looking forward to. If you guys want to see that, go ahead, hit the subscribe button, and that will pop up in your notification bar. And then you can come and watch all the videos that I'm posting all the time on this channel. But... Uh, with all that being said, I hope you all are having a great day. I hope you continue to have a great day, and I will see you all later.